Good morning. Good morning. This is Russ and Kitty Walden with Father's Heart Ministry, and this is the Morning Light Daily Bible Study, where we go through the Bible chapter by chapter, studying from a revelatory perspective. Good morning, Lakeisha. Wow, Hello, isn't Matthew. she quick? And Matt. <laughs> having a phone call with Matt later on today. That's right. Well, it's we're in the monsoon season here in Green Valley, Arizona. I wasn't sure what that meant. I couldn't imagine a place so dry. I thought when they first said monsoon, I thought, yeah, right. It's monsoon. a joke, right? <laughs> but actually, I can kind of see what they're talking about. We had a long soaking rain, kind of what I was used to when I spent 20 years in Louisiana, a little more than 20 years. Of course, in Louisiana, it would rain every day about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. You could set your watch by it. The afternoon thermals would come in. And, uh, but this is, uh, we're glad to see it. It has not rained. They had less than a half an inch of rain here in Green Valley the entire year. Last year. Last year. <clears throat> yeah. And I would imagine we came close to, we didn't have an inch, but I would say we came close to half an inch in the last 24 hours. Yeah. That's a good thing. It's wonderful. Our cactuses needed to drink. <laughs> Just as in Branson, we had a beautiful view. We're in what they call our Arizona room. It's a big room in the back of the house with lots of windows and sliding doors. And we get to look out in the morning, listen to the doves coo and watch the quails bring their babies out for the, to greet the day. It's so cute. They travel in families. The daddy, the mommy, and their little babies. Yeah, the mama comes first. The little baby quails that you can barely see 30 feet away. They're so tiny. And then the daddy quail comes back along behind. And uh, so we're new enough here to, that that's really uh, interesting to us. Uh, I read where one a neighboring resident here... Uh, Talked about how every morning he got up and checked for snakes in his backyard. And he got attacked by bees when he tried to water his rose bushes and was stunned 70 times. Ouch. Yes. And uh, we don't have any rose bushes. Uh, Not yet. But we have some plants. We'll be doing something along that line. We spend so much time on the road. How will we ever get somebody to water our plants? Except that I have. Two sister, three sisters that live in this town. That's right. <laughs> and they know how to water. And so we have our cup of coffee. We've fed the puppies. And we're ready to begin our study of the last chapter <clears throat> of Lamentations. And beginning tomorrow with Ezekiel. Um, oh I've been, one of those books I've been looking forward to. And it's going to be very interesting. Ezekiel is a, uh, is a completely unique book in the books of the Bible, particularly the first several chapters of it. And so... Are we going to use snorkel gear, honey, when we start as it goes? We're just going to lay hold on it, and we're going to go where it takes us. <laughs> Yay! The narrative. So if you have to get you a dive buddy, you just go ahead and do it. Get your <laughs> snorkel gear. Uh, check your tanks. Check your regulator for... <laughs> Beginning tomorrow in the book of Ezekiel. Today, Lamentations 5, the final chapter. Reminding God. Is he forgetful? Mm -hmm. Do you ever feel as though God has forgotten you? In this chapter, concluding the book of Lamentations, Jeremiah cries out to God that he might remember the people and show mercy. We might ask then, is God absent-minded. In this chapter, we learn how important it is, according to the scriptures, and even direct declarations of God himself, that we put him in remembrance. Sometimes we wonder just how much we are in God's mind. I know for myself, I was reading in the Psalms one day, and scripture said that God's thoughts toward us are more than the sands of the sea. And I was reading right along with that. And the Lord said, you don't believe that. I said, what do you mean I don't believe that? I believe even the leather of this Bible is genuine. <laughs> and he began to talk to me. And he said, you think 
that you are just some low-level functionary in the bureaucracy of the kingdom and that maybe once in a very oblique way in your lifetime, I might have fastened my regard upon you in a very marginal way. You don't believe that my thoughts towards you are more than the sand of the sea, that I'm counting every hair of your head. And I really had to do some, some repenting about my idea of God. And it wasn't that long ago. It was just a few years ago that I went through that and uh, began to just adjust my thinking. Uh, let's begin, if you just read, it's 22 verses, but they're very brief. If you just read the entire chapter, which begins with a cry of Jeremiah that God would remember the people. Remember, O Lord, what has come upon us, and consider and behold our reproach. Our inheritance is turned to strangers, our houses to aliens. We are orphans and fatherless, our mothers are as widows. We have drunken our water for money, our wood is sold unto us. Our necks are under persecution, we labor and have no rest. We have given to the hand to the Egyptians and the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. <clears throat> Servants have ruled over us. There is none that do, doth deliver us out of their hand. We begat our bread with peril of our lives because of the sword of the wilderness. Our skin was black like an oven because of terrible famine. They ravished the women in Zion and the maids in the cities of Judah. Princes are hanged up by their hands, and faces of elders were not honored. They took the young men to grind, and the children fell under the wood. The elders have ceased from the gate, the young men from their music. The joy of our heart has ceased, our dance is turned into mourning. The crown has fallen from our head, woe unto us that we have sinned. For this is our heart, this our heart is faint, for these things are our eyes dim. Because of the mountain of Zion, which is desolate, the foxes walk upon it. O Lord, remainest forever. Thy throne from generation to generation. Wherefore dost thou forget us forever and forsake us so long time? Turn thou unto us, o thee, unto thee, I'm sorry, turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Renew our days as of old, but thou hast utterly rejected us, thou art very wroth against us. Now, think about that. He says, this has happened because we have sinned. The crown has fallen from our head. Woe unto us that we have sinned. Now today, when modern day leaders speak on the subject of suffering, it is almost exclusively along the lines of we don't understand why suffering comes. It's the ineffable purposes of God because he loves us so much that he counts us worthy to suffer for his name. Yet that is almost a, uh, a polar opposite picture uh, regarding suffering that's given in the Bible throughout the scripture time and time and time again. It's we are suffering because we have sinned. And I could just ask uh, a question. You think about 9-11 when the Twin Towers came down. Do you think that happened because this nation, as a nation, God concluded us in sin? Do you think after aborting 50 million babies, more babies have been aborted than all the casualties in any theater of any nationality, including the Holocaust, more babies have been aborted in the United States than died in the entire epic of World War II, civilian or military casualties. Do you think that somehow that caused, like we studied how God said God allowed a cloud of darkness to come on the people and God is light. And so it speaks of God withdrawing himself. Do you think that that would happen? And then that, that should temper 
our vehement nationalism to become angry at the terrorists and feel so unjust, feel it was so unjustified what was done when perhaps it's the sinfulness of the nation of which we are a part, even if we never would agree with abortion, even if we would never have an abortion, if we would consider that a horrendous thing to do, yet we're in the midst. It's like Isaiah said, uh, you know, I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Just as you taught before that we are going to have to answer for the city that we're in, are we going to have to answer for our nation? I think so. Again, yeah. as when Jesus said, we just read over those verses, woe unto you, Chorazin, woe unto you, Bethsaida. If the works had been done in Sodom that had been done in thee, they would have repented to this day. The men of Sodom will stand in judgment against you in the day. Mm -hmm. And you think about that. That cities, if cities, <laughs> here's the other side of it. If cities can be judged, they can be saved. Mm -hmm. If a city can be judged in sin, it's because God has an expectation upon a city. What are you going to do when you, you have given an account to God for your individual life? your spouse, your children, your church. And then the Lord says, okay, I would like the city, I would like Kansas City to come forward now to be judged. I would like Nashville to come forward now and be judged. I would like Redding, California to come forward now and be judged. That's why the Bible teaches that we are kings and priests unto God. Mm -hmm. Priests are all about standing in the gap between the one who sins and the one who justify, who justifies us by the cleansing of the sacrifice that is given. And it's very sobering. And I don't think because of the, in our culture, we have glorified individualism as the highest expression of, of humanism. And we do not understand our connection to our community. We do not understand how God sees, sees these things. And we've allowed secularism from its inception to make religion a personal matter so much so that it's a very common thing for parents to say, no, no, I don't make my kids go to church. I don't even talk to them about God. Mm -hmm. When they get older, they can make up their own mind. And I've heard tongue-talking, Bible-believing parents say that uh, vehemently and dare you to suggest that they're not doing the right thing because we are so wrapped up in individualism because Satan wants to shut God out of the public square. He wants to shut God out of our cities. And unfortunately, because the church has, has acquiesced to that pressure, he's been very... Uh, effective. And so in the midst of this, remember that Jeremiah is <clears throat> pleading in behalf of a sinful people, a people that were generational idolaters, a people that practiced prostitution as a form of worship in the temple, a people that made their children to pass through the fire. Now understand what they did. With Chemosh, they would take the idol, which was made of metal, and they would build a fire in his belly so hot that it would become his arms that were outstretched. He would be sitting on a throne with his arms outstretched, and his metal arms would become white hot. And they would drop an infant onto those arms, and it would vaporize the baby, and it would make it look like the baby had been taken into heaven. That was what Solomon did on the holy mountain where he built the temple because of his pagan wives that he was married to. And that's what generations of Israelites did. All the while bringing sacrifice and incense and bullocks and sheep and practicing to the nth degree every minute protocol of Hebrew worship defined by Moses. It wasn't that they weren't doing the one, it's what they were doing beyond that because they had made a distinction between their personal life and their sacred 
protocols that they gave themselves over to. And this is the nation that Jeremiah is crying out to God to give them clemency, to give them forgiveness. And he's pleading to the Father to remember the suffering of a people who were justly suffering. We can talk about justice. One thing we better remember that we are born in enmity against God. The Bible says we are born aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. We are born alien, alienated from fellowship with God. Being an enemy with God is not because of what we do. It's who we are. We are in our persons, enemies of God. Yet God has chooses to have mercy upon us. And Jeremiah is crying out to remember the suffering of the people to remember the fact that their inheritance has been turned to strangers. And again, it begs the question, does God ever forget? This is more than a rhetorical question because God himself speaks of remembering in Genesis 9 to Noah and to the survivors of the deluge. Genesis 9, 16, And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember. And We taught on this. Many people teach this in Sunday school, that God put the rainbow to remind us that he'll never again destroy the earth through flood. That is incorrect. God put the bow in the cloud that he said that I may remember, and it's the same word remember that Jeremiah uses mm -hmm. in Lamentations 5, mm -hmm. that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Now, let's look into this word, remember. The Hebrew word for remember is zakar. So it's part of the name Zechariah. <clears throat> and it means to mark something. To mark something. Now, I will not forget my wife. I remember her name is Kitty. And even though we may, we, we may go do something and maybe I don't see her uh, all day long, but I'm not going to forget her. Mm -hmm. But what this is talking about is that God would mark us, that God would stamp his image upon us. <coughs> Forgive me. God, remember us. God, mark us. Stamp your image upon us. Mm -hmm. Because that is the very heart of creation, that he made a man in his image. He made a man who he marked, a man who he remembered. And so if I'm going to, I haven't forgotten Kitty, but I can mark her. I can go in there and take a laundry marker, and I can draw a big <laughs> old heart right here with RW and put an arrow through it. And she'd look like a sailor getting, getting off the, the deck and coming in for a weekend furlough. Uh, I can mark her. That root word implies that God would consider the people of the earth noteworthy on the base. It's like when you want to memorialize something and somebody goes out and gets a tattoo. Why are you doing that? You're marking something. Does not the Bible say we are graven? So now, now he said, now you mark. Are you asking God? God, mark us. Throughout the Bible, remember we talked about the sixth man ministry of the writer that goes out marking the servants of God in their forehead. Oh God, mark us. Mm -hmm. One of the most scandalous things uh, was when uh, Charles Manson and his followers uh, marked themselves with the swastika between their eyes. What were they doing? They were being marked and they were marked for life. I've seen uh, kids uh, put tattoos of 666 and KKK on their face. Marked for life. And that's the, the meaning of this word, remember. And it, again, it's the same word, Genesis 9, that Jeremiah uses in Lamentations 5. And it, it, this is a prayer that you and I are taught to pray. In Isaiah 43, 26, God said to his people, put me in remembrance. In other words, he's saying, provoke me to mark you. 
provoke me. We had a prophecy <laughs> at the conference we had in June from our mentor, uh, Walter Waller. He said, God said, you've provoked me now. <laughs> in a really nice way. In a really nice way. <laughs> to put me in remembrance. Provoke me to mark you. Let us plead together. I remember in the beginning, before Father's Heart Ministry launched, I spent 150 days every day sitting outside on the balcony with Kitty, praying through the Psalms and holding those pages in my hands and weeping and saying, God, if I can't have this, I'm taking it out of my Bible. And we, in the whole time, kitties just go tabasa, parabakas, tabasa. <laughs> well, and there was people down in the parking lot, neighbors, I'm sure. I didn't care what they thought. Uh, I, was, I was pleading. I was making my case. Not that I had to convince him of anything, but he told me to put him in remembrance, to provoke him to mark us. And you know, when I got to the end of that, 150-day period, it wasn't very long after that that Father's Heart Ministry began to lift off and to become what it is today. And yet we're taught by uh, weak-minded, anemic teachers, oh no, don't you question God. Don't you do that. And denying you through false piety the very breakthrough that God would give you. There's some people listening to me today it's time for you to do like Jacob and wrestle with the angel. Yeah, you're going to come away limping. Thank God. Because you're, then you're going to be looking to the Lord and not to your own ideas, and your own sense of yourself for what's going to provoke change in your life. Let us plead together. Declare thou. He wants us to make declarations that you may be justified, just as if you never sinned. Amen. There's a lot of people that are born again and they're in love with Jesus, but they've never put him in remembrance. They have never pled together with God. They have never made declaration. They've actually been taught not to do that. And they wonder why they're languishing and there's no difference between their life and the lives of those who are unjustified and don't believe in Jesus. It's because they've not entered into this. God tells us to put him in remembrance, to compel him by our prayers to mark us and to return our faithfulness to us and to consider us noteworthy in his dealings upon the earth. Do you ever feel as if you've escaped God's attention? Now God is all-knowing and he certainly never forgets anything or anyone. As we're instructed by Isaiah and exemplified by Jeremiah, to put him in remembrance. Now, think about that phrasing. It indicates a manner, now think about it, in which you can profoundly affect God. That if you put him in remembrance, he will give you the experience of justification. Not just legally provided for you, but you will experience justification. Where everything you say and do becomes as effective as if he said it or did it. You can put God by... Now listen to what he's saying. What he's saying, if you were putting in remembrance, you can leverage me to move my hand in your life. Oh, no, I'll get emails. No, you can't do that. Then if you don't think you can leverage God, then I suggest you turn to Isaiah 43, 6, and you take a laundry marker and you black that verse out. Because that's exactly what that verse says that you can, as a believer, profoundly affect the hand of God. You can put God by your prayers into a state of remembrance. Now, here's an example of someone who affected God, the woman with the issue of blood. Now, let's read it. Mark 5, 28 through, 20 through 30. For she said, if I may but touch his clothes, if I can but touch him, Yes, but we don't have Jesus with us anymore. But he said, it's expedient for you that I go away. That it's better for you, Jesus said. He said, we were more advantaged to have his Holy Spirit in us than to have his physical presence with us. Mm -hmm. And so whatever the equivalent is of drawing upon the Holy Spirit the way she pulled upon his physical garment, mm -hmm. we can have these same miracles. I realize there's a great declination of miracles in the earth. 
man, somebody gets a hangnail healed, and you're going to beam it around the world by satellite as though it's some kind of an anomaly. There's something profoundly wrong when there's not healing in the house. And we've come up with all this contaminated, polluted theology that's nauseating to, to the heart of God to explain why he said he would not put these uh, diseases upon you that are in the world, Exodus fifteen twenty six. but why we're experiencing it. And they say it's God's fault that God put that on. I tell you, I will preach healing if I'm never healed because I will vindicate the character of God as represented in his word. Amen. And those that say God put this cancer on grandma so that she could witness to her RN, that's nauseating. Mm -hmm. That means Christ plus, that God had to have Jesus and grandma mm -hmm. to manifest his glory. That somehow God had to suspend something defective in the gospel. That God had to suspend the merits of the cross in order to achieve his purpose in the earth by bringing sickness and things that he promised by the cross. He says, by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed, past provision, unconditional. Mm -hmm. It says, straight away the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed. And Jesus immediately knowing in himself, now listen what happened, that virtue had gone out of him. He had an autonomic response. When God says, you are the apple of my eye, that's the pupil. And the idea is, if I walk up to you and stick my finger in your eye, you're going to have an autonomic defensive response. And so God is saying that if anything touches you, I'm going to have an autonomic response. It's not something you're going to make a decision about. It's automatic. There's no cognition involved. That God has a reflexive response to defend you. See? Because you pulled, like you said, put me in remembrance, plead your cause, and because he felt virtue had gone out of him. This is very important for us because we've been taught that God cannot be compelled to do anything. Well, God always answers prayer, but sometimes he says no. Satan himself originates that. If you hear that in your pulpit, Satan himself is speaking through the one saying it. True. I don't care if they say it with tears on their eyes. I don't care if they say it with a tear in their throat and a sad story to go along with it. That is the most vile statement that you could ever make. It is, if, if God can be compelled, if God cannot be compelled, then why does he give us his covenant? Why would God give us a covenant if he is not compelled by the very covenant that he gives? In Isaiah 43, 26, God is inviting us in his own words to compel him to act. It's a foregone conclusion that if we do compel him to act, that he will do so. This is an evidence in the eight times, there were eight times in the Gospels that Jesus told someone, he said, your faith has made you whole. Now we know that Jesus is the healer, but the point of the statement was that their faith was the initiator of what happened next. It was an autonomic response that they pulled upon him by their faith. There were times that Jesus didn't say that because it was his faith that did it. See, you can pray for people that have no faith, and if you have faith, they can get healed. Jesus did it all the time. Mm -hmm. But then there are those that have faith, and their faith pulled upon Jesus. What were they doing? They were provoking him to mark them. They were putting him in remembrance. When Jeremiah prayed this prayer, you have to understand, there was an answer. Seventy years after the fall of Jerusalem. Now think about that. Jeremiah died shortly after this. This, this is scriptural evidence that prayers, the prayers of your parents, the prayers of your grandparents, outlive them in the earth. I know for a fact that my mama's prayers outlived her. I know my daddy's prayers outlived him. When my, mo when my mother died, I felt an avalanche of, of compelling spiritual uh, grace come into my life that I knew wasn't an exact answer to her prayer. 
and I was radically changed because the scripture says some men's works accrue to them in the earth and some follow after. Those prayers that have been prayed for you by generations past, even by people who may not even know you by name, there may be a saint somewhere on the backside of nowhere that's crying out to God with groanings that cannot be uttered and in that language of heaven is calling your name. God has a way to get somebody prayed for. If nobody's praying for you, God will raise somebody up to pray for you and to call your name. And those prayers have power. Those prayers out outlive the person that prays them. And here, 70 years later, after the fall of Jerusalem, we see the restoration of the walls of the temple began and came to completion. And when you pray, you pray, you put God into remembrance. Now, what are you putting him into remembrance of? And here's something else. Are you putting him into remembrance of just how lousy your circumstance is? <laughs> what are you putting him in? I want to remind you, you know, if I'm going to have a chat with my wife, I, I don't want to say, well, let me remind you of uh, uh, something where, you know, maybe I hurt her feelings or, or something that's not a pleasant memory for her. Well, I'm not going to remind her of that. What are, we going to, what are we going to remind one another of? If we're going to put him in remembrance of what? You're going to have to have a knowledge of his promises. According to Herbert Lockyer, author of All the Promises of the Bible, he reports that a man by the name of Everett Storms, in his 27th reading of the Bible, read the whole Bible through 27 times, he accounted for 7,487 promises of God to humanity. The Bible then becomes for us a contractual agreement that we are invited by God to keep an ongoing reconciliation of our life to his promise and finding a discrepancy, we are invited to remind God and ask him to mark us or to put us down for the fulfillment of whatever particular promise is showing as unfulfilled yet in our lives. But yet we've been taught to take the contradiction between God's promise in our lives and carry it as a sacred honor and we'll understand it better by and by. Do you realize how wrong that is? Do you realize how that attitude, however pious it may seem, it's spitting upon the cross of Christ? Jeremiah concludes the chapter imploring the Father, says, turn again to the people. Now, they are still stained generationally by centuries of pagan worship. But the answer that God sends, what is the answer? 600 years later, he sent a basis to establish a means by which their sins, once washed away by the cleansing blood, may no longer stand as a disqualification to the promise of his word applied to our need and applied to our lives. Watchman Nee wrote a book I would recommend to you. The name of it is Let Us Pray. It's a very simple book on prayer. And it basically proposes prayer like this. Prayer is, number one, God communicates his will to us through his word. We perceive his will. And we return his will back to him in prayer. And then he performs his will. But yet I have seen people, I have seen people who consider themselves deeply spiritual say, God knows what I have need of. He wants, if he wants me to have something, he'll give it to me. As though somehow it, that's, they're, they're more spiritual than God is what they are. And it's a stench in God's nostrils. Uh, they, they don't understand that God communicates his will to us. We return his will back, back to him in prayer. We put him in remembrance. And then he performs his will. Somehow we want him to circumvent that. And how many times have we complained to God about something we never actually prayed to him about? And if your prayer is not based on a promise, if you're just praying because of a general uh, concern for the burdens of what you're going through, or are we, if we're going to remember there must be a basis. There must be a basis for reminding him. And that's where his word comes in. 
We must be able to go to the word of God and say, God, like I did when I went through the book of Psalms, probably the most profound uh, outcome of prayer for me when I went through the book of Psalms and prayed those Psalms. And I said, God, this man was a murderer and he was an adulterer. But look what you did for him. Why wouldn't you do that for me? If you're not going to do this for me, I need to know now. And I went through, and you can ask Kitty, I sat there ready to tear pages out of my Bible because I was not willing to live in this anemic, lukewarm, dishwater culture of Christianity that's willing to live without, uh, without answered prayer. And I don't think God was offended at all. I heard Steve Schultz say something to this. How was it he put, put that? God is more interested in relationship than he is in respect. That's right. That really, and you say, how could he say that? If you knew what Steve Schultz has gone through, you'd understand it. Steve Schultz of Elijah List is a walking miracle. Amen. And, but he's paid a price for his understanding of getting into real, on, Kitty says, honest to God relationship Absolutely. with him. So I want to encourage you. Why study the book of Lamentations? The book of Lamentations the content of the book of Lamentation, the period of history that it covers is one of the most profound watershed moments for all human history because it is the implications of what happens there that ultimately brought the message of the cross to all humanity because the natural olive branch was broken off that the wild olive branch might be grafted in and you and I became recipients of a gospel that has been preached around the world. It's important for us to understand what's happening here, even if it isn't pleasant at times to study these difficult passages. And so go out in your day to day and put him in remembrance. God, give us the grace to put you in remembrance, to follow the protocols of your word and to come before you as a people that will humble ourselves to your process. It's not our process. It's your process. It's your way of getting things done. And God, there are glaring chasms of contradiction in our lives to your promises, to your character, to your mandates. And we want to see those things reconciled. We want to see that there is not a seam that there is not a wrinkle, there is not a shadow of variation between the complexion of our lives and the character of your promise. We want to see you get what you paid for in us, yes. and we want to receive everything that Jesus paid for. We want the full dividends of the cross to be paid in our lives. Yes. And we ask God to look upon us as we have disparaged grace, as we've fallen so far short, and ask by your grace, you said, no man comes to the Father except the Spirit draw. We say, as, as, with, as David said, draw me and I will run after thee. Yes. That we would not be left behind in those things that you're doing in the earth. And that our loved ones would not be left behind. But that would be a, we would be marked men and marked women that the writer with the inkhorn would mark us. So much so that it would be conspicuously obvious without opening our mouth, even walking into a public venue. Yes. There would be conspicuously obvious, not by any religious oddity or dress, because of some, but because of something resonating off of us. Yes that others that don't even believe in you would take knowledge of us that we've been with Jesus. We cry out to you, O oh God, that you can take, if you can take 12 men in an obscure fishing village in Galilee and change the world, what could you do through the venue of this obscure little broadcast with a handful of people to so mark us that the world would be changed. Even so, Father God, let 
Let that be the outcome in the name of Jesus. Amen.